Oh, I'm a, okay. Wait, second. It's Question, two tech. Is this okay? Go ahead. Yeah. All right, uh, Patrick, just to see if you can hear us. Okay, Um. yeah, Dylan, we can get to, to move on. So I don't. Hello, uh, my name is Ted. Um, I prefer to PCB pronounce speech. I'm talking to you. Hello, my name is Ted. Um, I prefer to PCB pronounce speech. I'm talking to you. Hello, my name is Ted. Um, I prefer to PCB pronounce speech. I'm talking to you. Okay, so I want you to do that. So you go to the speech. If you want to give your name, you speak in order of the first name, which is Joseph, or who you are introducing. Oh, I had you guys to meet today. I also expect you to try to hack around your calls for your speech. Oh, and also their consent to be recorded. Okay. It's much safer. Okay. Uh, first, Alex, you should be a second, Alex, car, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, then, in opening opposition, Republic of North Ireland, South Macedonia. Woo! In closing opening, oh, it's a special way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In those who go successful only at heavy blades of grass. <laughs> and then we have to and finally, in those opposition, Sino German Renaissance. Three speakers here, they and I expect to go. Okay, like January 1st follows. Our celebrated selected the first and last minute being spent trying to be which you can and should offer points of information and constitute a work hard engagement. And the first book you can do with your staff, and then three times 2015, we think they should stop speaking. Although, if you need a final, you can do what you want, you just want to write anything back. <laughs> if there are no questions, then without further ado, I'd like to call upon Prime Minister to open the case time in their name. Here, here. <laughs> Starting in three, two, one. How? I know that most people in this room are relatively young, and many, you know, talk around, maybe they have experienced what sustained love that lasts for 15 years with a person that you think is your soulmate, who you don't want to betray, with whom you have memories that account for almost half of your life is not a person that you want to leave. It's not a person that you want to leave if they were to get into a coma and had a very small chance of eventually waking up. And it is not a person that you want to leave if they are affected by the condition of this moment. Firstly, let's frame out with four pieces of framing who you are as a person based off of this motion. Firstly, you are someone who has spent a long, long time in a committed monogamous relationship. Note that the average person, I would say, is relatively incapable of doing this, right? Many people don't like commitment. Many people engage in monogamous relationships, but break it, which means that your intuition as to how this person thinks are unlikely to be correct. That is to say, this person values loyalty as an extremely important value because they could have done a lot of other stuff, like maybe sleep around, which can be a lot of fun, which means that they value loyalty as a concept in and of itself. That means that if you were to break this monogamous relationship, break the promises that you've made to each other, you're likely to feel extremely guilty. You're likely to feel as someone who has betrayed your partner. Second point, though, is uh, you, you love your partner tremendously. You want them to be as happy as they possibly can. You are very often able to prioritize your own needs above their needs. That is to say, you are super willing to sacrifice many aspects of your life in order to remain with them, in order to keep them company. No, thank you. In, in, and, 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 in, and in order to make sure that, you know, that they don't live an extremely stressful life. 
Uh, this is important because the intuition here is the sacrifices that people are able to commit when someone close to them is affected with the condition of a similar kind. The mother of a disabled child, child who throws her life just to care for that one person, even if they are maybe mentally disabled and they're not the same person that they used to be before, but it is a bond that you value and it is a person for whom you would do everything that you can, irrespective of the psychological condition or the, the, the extent to which their personhood was ripped apart for them. Thirdly, as any other person, you are likely to have an extreme optimism bias. This means two key things. One, the 10% chance of that we're becoming a human is likely to be extremely overvalued. That's the reason why people buy lottery tickets, even though it's the stupidest fucking thing you can do. We overvalue small percentages. So you're likely to perceive this as more likely than what the motion says. But two, you never know what's going to happen. Maybe something else will happen magically and that person will come back, which means that you're likely to be extremely hopeful. Fourth point of framing is that you have immense trust in your partner, which has been built throughout 15 years of sustained monogamy. No, thank you. Because of that, you believe that they would do the same for you because you have you have been there through the hardships of the other person and have probably done similar things for each other in the past. And based off of this, you would want the same to be done to them. What is the comparative? Firstly, you might keep the worm, for example, somewhere and still care about it, but you are no longer in a committed monogamous relationship with it. This is problematic because the worm, since it is still sentient, since it might still have access to the memories that it is creating when it becomes human, is going to experience immense trauma. This looks like A, maybe you bring someone home, you of course don't like have sex in front of the fucking worm, but then the <laughs> worm can hear the giggling of another person and see that they're being replaced, that this is being stripped away from them, right? Or two, it can look like them just like being locked away for a long time and knowing that something suspicious is going on there. Or you might just toss the worm, right? Which is extremely terrible for its life, but you might be likely to do this because seeing the worm on a day-to-day -day basis is something that constantly reminds you, reminds you of the betrayal that you committed. Sure. The world where ten percent of people become worlds. Uh -huh. There can be a system of allocation of worlds for work. Or <laughs> I don't know. You can you can run that. Out. Thirdly, you will be constantly reminded of them if you ever try to engage in another relationship because there are small things that they did that that remind you of them constantly, and that you can find in other people. It's the way that they fucking cut the bread. That makes you ex that makes you extremely emotional for them. That was the little thing that you cared about, right? It is that <laughs> someone else that you're newly with doing a gesture or flicking their hair the way that the partner did that immediately reminds you of the partner and sends you fucking spiraling. You're constantly contemplating the fact that something could have happened, but you are unable to recreate the thing that you had with the partner with other people. Which leads me to the fourth point. You're constantly played by what if questions. What if I stayed with them and we maybe could have made it work? What if the 10% chance would have happened? And people get absolutely fucking batshit crazy off of uncertain what if questions. These are things that people struggle with for the rest of their lives and that burn them throughout the day-to-day the, the -day life that they are living. Why, why then are the other things that you're going to sacrifice not as important, right? A, you still get to be with that person once a year. So everything that you got from that relationship is still acceptable. And know that people are extremely able to adapt, right? For example, things like our need, need for sex are oftentimes dependent on how much of it we're getting, or our libido is oftentimes fucked by our environment, which is to say people who watch a lot of porn and have more libido, but people who then get off it also have their preferences shift, and you no longer require as much of this, right? Something similar exists with other things, like maybe emotional connection, which can also be supplemented by friends, or emotional intimacy, which you can also get used to. This is important because there's already other people who are able to sacrifice this for other goals, right? People who live solitary lifestyles because they have a deep belief about something, whether it be religion or something else. And given that you have been with this person for so long, it is extremely likely that you are able to, to replicate that. Lastly, though, you can always tap into your memories. And note 
that your perceived reality, your imagination, your memories are oftentimes factually the same thing, which is why people are able to like repattern themselves and try and transform traumatic memories that they have, which means that you can always find solace in the good times and you won't feel guilty or that you are a betrayer. Extremely proud to be a Once the clarification gets opened up and it starts, we not want to hear that your partner becomes a partner again. We want to hear that they can communicate. We think the partner you love is gone. They are dead socially because the thing that happened to us came to forever. And turning into a worm, having your form change forever, no longer being able to communicate with anyone in your life, being genuinely beside and shaped for worm, no limbs, no experience or access to things that were in your life before, changes who you are. The person you love is no longer the person with you, and we think you go to the same location to them as you had before. Even if they can't come back, it is a different person who can experience the change them, and you will never understand the experiences in your friends. What you think is they bad way to get they'll be part of you for the rest of your life. Firstly, this agreement method sex is a word of impossible, or at least weird. <laughs> They do not have any sense of being sex organ, but they're very important. There's no ability for the world to verbally communicate with you at all because you have been 64 days of the year, which is there's no ability to oh, communicate preferences. You can communicate with one another, what it is that you care about. You can share a meaningful moment of intimacy, even without action, which can help communicate the love you have for each other in that moment in any way. What that means is that you lose a massive part of your life. And I would not care for the next 15 years that a person has been something particularly important to you. A moment of intimacy more than being shared repeatedly with this person is now taken away forever. Obviously, sex is also enjoyable, it means endorphins, it means good for people, but it is also something that is important to the relationship and lost forever by this emotion. We think that is a bad thing. And also, it's like you're so frustrated at your partner because the thing that was once part of the relationship is now no longer there, and losing access to those benefits is what will likely frustrate Secondly, no other communication can happen either. And we think that's going to be bad for you because communication makes up the vast majority of what is valuable to that relationship. Someone you've been in a relationship with for 15 years is the person you turn to when you want advice, the person you turn to when something good happens, when something bad happens, the one you talk through your problems with, is the person you made big decisions with in the past and want to make big decisions with in the future. The inability for them to ever communicate with you or talk to you anymore is a massive loss. It is a huge gaping silence in your life, and we think one that cannot be understood. You cannot actually ask the same for advice. You cannot ask them for if, if you had a bad day for comfort, if you had a good day to celebrate with you. If you cannot hear about their day, how their experiences are going, if it's one day a year. We think a lot of that means the yeah, actual yeah. ability to communicate for a meaningful, but like a genuinely meaningful interaction between the two of you is impossible because what you then do as a result of this. Thirdly, I think normal people, as the normal will offer right. these relationships also fail. If you have someone who is committed to consistent and in health to you for 15 years, you let them live together, you let them share shared income in your house, you let them do things, if one who cooks, the other does the dishes, and all of those things go away. You feel the physical lack of presence of your partner in your life, partly because they physical practical harm to not have that income in your life anymore, but also the fact that they just aren't there helping the dishes. You can't cook together, you can't go to dinner together and share the experience of being with one another because they are not a human and they cannot have those experiences with you. It's when you notice every day. When you see couples on the street who get to hold hands with each other, you lack, you remember what you lack. When you see you're, you're, you're invited to Christmas, you are the Christmas you shared before, you share these experiences. This is something you know you lack. When you want to come over tonight and you want someone to grow up with, you can't have that anymore. And you are constantly aware of the things in your life and nothing no longer able to do to keep it up that. Fourthly, I think there's a constant and powerful fear of harm happening to worry to stay with you. You're, 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 you
Are they going to be able to accept themselves? It's very likely they're going to be eaten up like a bird. And if we're not going to be to your partner, we should count on ourselves, count on everybody's gifts, we're counting on ourselves, empathize with, and we will worry about them. It will save you. Right. You will know and you worry that these things happen to your partner, and you will feel like you are responsible if anything does happen. I think that fear of people also comes from, but you don't even have the partner sitting here to confide in about it because no one is like you can actually communicate with on this. We think many people will tell you to break up with your partner. Yeah, yeah. Even if there's some of the trend of other people turning into work, in Friday, it's not normalized people in relationships with work. I think that needs to clear not an understanding that people understand what relationships look like. I think you have a visceral response to the unknown. And what that looks like is when your friends and family say, Look at the losses. You can't talk to one another. You can't share any experiences. They can't be there for more. You have to be constantly justifying why you stay, justifying to yourself and your loved ones why it was a good idea, knowing it was something that would be a mess for you, and knowing that your family and friends will never empathize with your situation because it's so unique. It's not something that they're used to. I would not only compare this, it's why you would like people to break up with other individuals. And your family know how to support you. When my friends were growing up with you, they've been with for a long time. I know what to offer. I know something that I can offer to come to their house and be there if they need to hear. I can bring up my advice to you. You can just cry. There are norms of what it is that you do in response to breaking up with other people who are important in their lives. There are not the ones to you if your partner can control the room. And I think even if your support network don't tell you to break up with them, you don't have to constantly justify this. I think they do not know how to support you, and therefore you do not get the support you need, and that is a harm. Before going on, we do. Uh, can dogs speak English? I don't care. The impact of this, I think there's a number of bad things that happen in this. One, you have the grief of the lost relationship. You must okay. suffer on your own. The reason like this go when people cannot support you in the context where they have turned into the world. There's only a 10% chance that they will turn back into the world. Directly, it's OG here. I think it's extremely unlikely you can still turn back into a human and there'll be enough of them. I would pause it when they assert that we are inherently optimistic. We are not. We are inherently pessimistic. We think it's more like a god who has looked evolutionary. It was important to predict the things, the fact that risks might happen, and to try and head for our safety to survive. This is to the state. Additionally, we generally are put a negative team on when we try to create these worlds, and I think it means we're more likely to think they will not be the and will not be the ones we have discussed by growth. Secondly, as outlines to how it will play out, I think it's constant stress and constant change in state of relationship, and that's that. The way you see is this a relationship that was huge for you, losing this and closing off future love when previously you've shown that you do care about this, but also losing someone and then having to care for a worm in a way you can never understand or empathize with when no one is getting advice, I think is a constant pressure on you and a constant sense of failing this person if you are to stay with them. What do we stand by in those concerns of alternatives? Because I think what I would say is bad and what you will likely feel bad to be going through. Firstly, I think what you've broken up with people before, and like I said, like have support networks. But secondly, even if you feel bad, the push way in your on our side is a general very fun. They break up with it hurts, but after a year, two years, you will heal. On their side, it is the rest of your life devoted to constant pain, grief, and stress, which you think is avoidable and not in your interest. First alternative is that you will love again. And I think there are reasons why this is likely to be who you will stand upon, and some that you can engage with, which is what you want. But secondly, I think even if you don't love again, and the opportunity to find out who you are after this relationship, it's one that means not to keep with this world for the rest of your life, but to be you as an individual, and there's nothing to stop you, even if you never love again. At the end of this speech, I also want to thank everyone for my partner in the competition. It's been a genuine pleasure. I didn't think I was going to come back to speaking at big competitions after last year, but I really have enjoyed doing so. And it's always pleasant to do with someone who is not only really wanted to speak with, but also a genuine friend. Uh, so I just had a meeting. <laughs> I'm not just motion. Yeah, I, I, I uh, click on the down button on the or the space bar oh, keyboard. Right. Oh, oh it, is that just good? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wait, I'm gonna do any microphone.
The biggest problem I have with this opening opposition is they do not provide a viable alternative. They never tell you why you fall in love again. What we told you very clearly in our prime minister is even if you try, even if you get the support from your friends and your family, if one, you see a glimpse of your worm partner within this person, it fucking breaks you. If it's the simplest thing from how they cut bread or the jokes they make, or that they did the same, you had the same first day, you will continually be reminded of what you had with your past partner and what could be. As a result, they have a huge gaping issue in their case, which I'll explain. I want to give some extraneous reputation, and then what I'll do, hopefully steal their attention, talk more about how the worm feels and how you then feel really bad. So let's talk about a few things. One, they say you won't be able to get proper support. We think a support structure is incredibly likely to arise simply because it's a society-wide phenomenon. We believe the support structure will be good, like for instance, your parents or your friends, simply because they understand the immense pain that you feel. Therefore, they are likely immediately as this happens in order to have proper resources, because maybe it happened to them too. Or for instance, there will be massive fora, whatever other pieces of information online. It will be able to be personalized because it happens to everyone and there's heterogeneity across society. So probably someone shares some of your also uh, 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 specific characteristics or details. As a result, you're also able to get not only from your parents, but also personalized and important uh, 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 information. The second is you're also just sort of able to uh, adapt to a lot of this just over time. So second, they then say you're not able to have sex. So one, I just want to pause it for all the people, it's better if you do it yourself. So that's like one thing. <laughs> so like, let's, let's put like women, um, better, better not me. Um, so second thing is also your libido is a function of how frequently you have sex or get it. Of course, it's less when you live in Kamala Corny. It's, you know, a lot of months on yeah. find like this, so thank you. But <laughs> also, also thirdly, what we're going to posit is the physical pain of the emotions we talked about in Prime Minister far outweigh the physical pain or distress you have from not having sex. So at worst, you are a little frustrated and you're like, ah, I'm horny. But what we're telling you is you have a gaping chasm in your chest. You are unable to find love. You feel guilty if you give them up. You are unable to reintegrate into your life properly. So I guess, okay, you guys can be a little horny, but at least we're not broken. So this is why we think it's okay with sex. Finally, they sort of talk about like you won't be able to enjoy life as much, blah, blah, blah. But we think the important thing here is in our frame, we thought that it's a healthy relationship. Also talk about things in people's life. As a result, you probably have many outside things in your life. So you probably have an enjoyable job or you have lots of hobbies or good friends. As a result, even though you're not as much with your partner, you're also likely to find good and healthy alternatives outside. Therefore, you're also able to explore yourself through this. Or for instance, you don't have like a, a it, it isn't as terrible that your partner isn't there all the time as a result of that. Therefore, I think this mitigates both of the things. What then happens is we then have a question, okay, so no thank you, you're a little horny, you, you're, you're a bit sad, but how does this trade off with all the things we talked about? So what I'm going to tell you here, uh, extending from Alex, is to tell you why you really care about how the worm feels and tell you how the worm actually feels. There are five reasons for why you perceive them still as a human with human sentience. One, because of the memories you have. You are unable to disassociate the, the memories you have with this person or this worm now, because whenever you look at them, you think back to that. It's normal, like characteristic association that we had evolutionary. Second is the association of the emotions. No, no, no thank you. you. We are completely, no thank you later. We are completely unable to de detach the emotions we have with a certain person, for instance, if they're in a coma or they are dead, we still have the memories. Third is also the fact that you might see them, for instance, in your children or maybe your friends that they introduce you to. And fourth, because simply it's a coping mechanism for you to understand that when you are unable to disassociate them, in the same way that you're unable to do it with death or, for instance, a dog. As a result, you still perceive them as humans. But therefore, it's extremely important how the worm feels because you will then believe that if the worm feels bad, they feel bad as a person and therefore you feel terrible as well because you care about them so much. I'll talk about whether the worm feels bad. Yes. If I split my worm daddy boyfriend into two, could I date both of them or would I have to pick one? <laughs> you mean, I have no idea what that means. If you split a worm, both halves exist as sentient beings. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you probably don't want to split your wife. Um, I don't know. You <laughs> mean, no. So, why do you still care? Why? So, how does your, your, your work feel? There are two things you can do. 
You can put it in a terrarium at home, or you can put it into their allocation mechanism. So for your terrarium, there are three things your worm is feeling. One, for instance, they see the other person that you have invited to your home. They see the other woman, and because they have such data capacity for a moment, it's likely that you promised you will stay with them because it was a loving relationship. So you are betraying them on that promise. And this one can still feel the betrayal. So they feel terrible. The second is, for instance, that how you, uh, how, how, the, for instance, it's also the things that you that, that you are doing with, with uh, uh, around that terrarium also continually reminds us that worm is able to associate and go back into their memories and see, ah, I wish I was doing this also with you. As a result, the worm feels terrible, but because you still perceive them as a person, you then feel terrible about the worm feeling terrible. In turn, no, thank you. In turn, because you are so loyal and care about them so much as we talked about in our framing, you also feel like a terrible person. On a way, this is extremely important because how you perceive yourself, if you are a selfish person, can supersede anything else. So if you believe you are, no, thank you, you are a piece of shit that will also reflect terribly on you. So you are sad, what Alex tells you, and I'm also telling you will feel like a piece of shit. That's not a good combination. As a result, you probably do not want to leave them as a result. The second option is you give them away, which is far, far worse. So then you will feel like you have completely given up on that 10% chance, which Alex told you about is, is feeling terrible for you. But second, you also then never know what could be, and that absolutely terrorizes you because it means you have completely given up. So they want to run their allocation mechanism. It's actually even worse for you. In turn, you also then feel like a terrible person because you have then given away your possible love and you have completely betrayed everything you had with them. So what we've shown you here is first, we gave substantial mitigation or even that this person won't even care that much about the communication, sex, you have a support system and they give you no alternative. But what we're telling you is there are clear harms where you feel like a terrible person. That continues feeding into you feeling extremely sad. And as a result, you do not want to do this. And for all these reasons, you should vote for the government. <laughs> Uh, I would like to remind everyone that what they say does not reflect my beliefs. <laughs> All of the Bulgarians can make fun of me by the British, so let's do the goal of fashion. I'll give you three separate weighing mechanisms as to why we beat them, then I'll flip their case and explain to you why breaking with the war helps the war if you really want to uh, be with the war. But before that, three points of external rebuttal that go into these ways. And just the first is a comment. Their case assumes that a normal relationship between you and the war is something possible to have. I listened to both of the speeches. There is no analysis as to why a normal relationship will continue to function. Versus five mechanisms as to why this relationship will be bad. If that is the case, and they are, they are accused us of not having a comparative, the only thing that they have as a harm is that the breakup will be mentally bad for you. So if I outweigh this, then I'll be beating them within the debate. But two more things here. They say, oh, people will be understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Inclusion problem. Gay people exist, LGBTQ people exist. At the same time, people are not very understanding of this, right? That it's more, more or less the same percentages. People are massively homophobes. Why? Because this is something uh, that's different to them, that people are not necessarily connected with, that exists, but you're likely to be very skeptical or hateful against what is different. And if this thing has happened for a long time, which probably since the beginning of time, this has existed, then that means that generally the eye is very, very bad. But secondly, as a parent, you're really, really shameful if you're the parent of the kids that they think of born, right? Like, guys, this is the normal reaction they don't have. Then on sex, they say, oh, according is blah, blah, blah. Can you... Being in a relationship where you don't have sex, do you know how bad this is? It is super frustrating in many of these cases. You feel very bad. It intersects any other aspect of your life. Why? Because people very deeply prioritize this particularly. This is why, like, this is higher than our intellect in many of these cases, because we're still monkeys to a certain extent, right? We have the monkey brain. We think primitively. We think about the endorphins and the chemicals within our head. So even if you have, you do have a good relationship, this is bad. Yeah. Not the only response is they Let's get into a first point of weight. Their farms are short -term. This could be maximum six months, a year and a half. Why is this true? And here I'll do something which many debaters don't do. I'll actually give analysis for the way. Because first, 
Most people move on. Why is this true? Because in the past, most likely you have had relationship where you had to move on because most people don't stay together with the first person they date in this particular case. So you know this experience, you know it's not bad. It's easy for you to flee from one thing to another. But secondly, you'll just be pushed to move on because of loneliness in many of these cases, right? You'll simply feel that and you'll be like, gee, maybe I should change my life in this particular case. Maybe I should go outside. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should, or even if you don't find the person, the simple act of you going more to your job, taking up new hobbies, trying to feel this way it's something that will happen but second you will just simply meet other people because you have to go out socialize keep in touch with your friends our arms are long from because you have to stay with this person who's will be until the end of your life you have to stay with this and go through the grueling existence of not having sex with them not being able to communicate with them i'm wondering if you're going to step on them of your parents also like you can be against them note these are very deeply emotional yeah. and problematic cars with you your relationship is the biggest part of your existence for many cases. It trumps your job. It trumps all of your other networks. So if, if, how do you say, if you feel very bad in this sort of case, if you give this negative emotion, it's a wide span of time. It's better for you to take off the band-aid and feel this pain in the short term, which may even be as, as big as they say, you need to go get over it. Whereas our harms will continue for this particular case. But I don't know. The severity of our harms are bigger because they compound over each other in this particular case. Because any one interaction compounds on the other interaction. Because you have to wake up and it's day 665 in this particular case. And again, you have to be careful not to step on the worm. Again, you can't have sex with the worm in this particular case. So you're likely to compound with each other, feel negative, go crazy in many of these cases. And you can't really rationalize it because you can't really talk to someone, right? You can't really talk about it because many people don't really want to talk about these things, about their relationship and these so in the in these sorts of things. They say, and there are a response to maybe counter analysis they have, that you feel guilt. But you have some rationalization mechanisms to you, right? You can tell yourself, oh, this is just a random thing that happened to you. I have no fault in this particular case. This is the likely version of this event because you have to go move on with your life, right? You have to explain it for this particular case. And then they say, oh, but there's always a 10% chance and people are optimistic they win the office. Let's not say, say that this is true, even though I don't think it's true. Because the more time passes on, the less likely it is for you to think about this particular case. The less likely it is for you to care for this particular case, because it's hard to keep up for this type of thing. But finally, even if you don't buy any of this, and the harms are equal, we have a benefit, they have just a harm. Why do we have a benefit? Uh, because you'll simply find another partner. Why is this like? First, many divorce, many divorced people, right? Like the US average of born broken the trajectory of divorces is spiral in this particular case. That means that there are many people who are in their 30s, in their 40s, who are, how do you say, free. They want to date people because they don't want to feel lonely, because they practically want to live with someone in this particular case. They want to feel Secondly, there are many single people in their thirties and forties that you can also date in this particular case. But notice, dating is super easy, right? You just download fucking Tinder and you do it. You just go out to the bar and talk to people. So you're likely to do this particular case. So on the balance of probabilities, per se, they take three, five years. You may have a couple of hookups here and there between them, but you'll be able to find someone. And let's say our worst case. This is not the same relationship, right? It could still be bad. You may hate some aspects of them. You may not necessarily love them. It's still a relationship, right? You can still have sex with them. You can still talk with them and share what happened with your day. You can still build up new memories with this new person. You can have a good life in this particular case. You won't be ashamed to bring them to your parents because it's a fucking world in this particular case. So even if it's not bad, the same amount of work. At least you have a benefit on our side of us. So even if their harm is greater, more severe, whatever the fuck you want to weigh, benefit, right? There is a benefit that can scale over time and can continue with this sort of thing. Before I get into the flipping CGM. That's your suggestion. Bait and food, right? No, man, no. <laughs> like, okay, boring debate in the time. If this happens, society still needs to function. People still need to do this. Most likely we'll have invented some kind of system of allocating these worms and like having worm drops and shit like that. Right? Which brings me to, I would say, my 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 little conclusion. Just all of this assume that the worm wants to stay with, but the worm may not want to stay with. Think about it. If the worm is it, and this is a completely serious point, if the worm is with another worm, the worm can have sex, the worm can communicate with another worm, the worm can continue this particular case. No, the worm may not want to break up with you for the same reasons that we we enter, but break up with you maybe good in this particular case, right? Because the worm can move on and find another worm. And being that's only this part of the worm is like this is completely serious point that you can start away from normal relationships if the relationship is toxic, which we already proved to. So we even if you like the you should prioritize only the worm, the worm will be better when you break up with it and can find another worm in this particular case. But Let's be clear on this particular case. You 
don't owe anything to anyone in life in this particular case. You are your own human being. Your happiness is the most important thing because you are the only person who has access to your happiness. If that's the case, if we give you an out, then you can remove the bandage, fill it with pain, but you don't have to go through a traumatic experience that doesn't end on their side and then find some kind of okay relationship. I'm moderately pro. <laughs> Very simple. Dating a worm is better than any possible relationship you might get with any possible human. And that, I think, is a very obvious reason why we're going to win the debate. But also, we're going to talk about the morality because we think you do have an obligation for this worm, particularly to date them. And that's something we can do. Now, on to this then. Why is dating absolutely awful on their side of the house? I think that dating as a middle aged person is shit. And I obviously Obviously, you want to date again. I mean, oh, I can see this uh, thing. Like, there are positive cases that you're going to date again. So, fine, you're the only need to give reasons why this is likely. Maybe the support network that's opening also to the magic for that you do instead. I think that dating is incredibly depressing and difficult. Now, the reason is very simple. You haven't really gone through this in a, for a very long period of time. You don't know the current norms that exist in, in dating. You are constantly navigating the like super complex phenomena around it. How to manage or organize a particular date or whatever. And it's super annoying and weird to like manage that overall. And I know it's especially bad for middle aged people, often who have their own like level of happiness they're dealing with. Oftentimes, your choices are incredibly limited as a result of that as well. And so, in general, like, I don't think it's fair for them to say, ah, you're picking from a great pool of people, and so you're going to get a large level of dating. I don't think that's necessarily like. And like, Ruben says, ah, it's very easy. All you need to do is get an app. Man, I tried getting these apps. <laughs> and it's like fucking depressing, right? Like, then essentially essentializing yourself because you have to present images in your own body that make you feel super insecure and uncomfortable around that. And then like, like essentializing people down to that and doing that as well. It's incredibly commodified, incredibly awful. It makes you incredibly depressed. But let's suppose you find somebody and you think that they're the one again. But like, that still might not be likely to succeed for many different reasons. But the fact that there's a risk of betrayal from that person, that even if you start a relationship with them, they might betray you into the long term, and then you feel like you're constantly doomed in your love life overall. Because they may have things about them that you only realize when you start to date them in the long term overall, that are incredibly irritating or frustrating or that you deeply disagree with and so on. So, like, actually, the proof of the pudding here is that what Ruben says about divorce is, insofar as most relationships end in failure, that probably shows that actually most of those relationships are to some extent regrettable and you don't want to get in them. So, on the comparative, what you have is a guaranteed certain relationship of someone who loves you in the form of this one, and that's likely to be far better. So, essentially, what this is designed to show is that there's probably a less than 10% chance that you end up in a successful, stable, loving relationship that's as good as what you had before. Um, and in so far as that's the case, I don't think that material about relationships works. Uh -huh. Now, secondly, why is dating a one great? Now, a few things I want to know is the first is like, why do you date in the first place? And like, why are you in love with the person? And I don't think it's because of any necessary physical traits or even personality traits about the individual. The reason is that obviously people naturally change over time. And it's really hard to find a continuous account of like that personal identity that consists through that. This is just a really extreme example of that where this person has undergone a really drastic change. But we still think we really love them because of who they are and their fundamental nature as the one. They still have some level of sentience and so on. The second thing I would note is you still can have a level of good intimacy with the worm, right? You know, it can like wriggle and like cuddle with you kind of, and it's a worm, but it's like worm cuddles. And that's probably quite a good thing, right? Because it means you're able to get that level of physical connection that is relatively important. 
Uh, and you know, they say, ah, oh, but you can step on the worm, but no, you can just keep the worm in like a designed, habitated environment for the worm. I, I don't think that's plausible. Third of all, I think, contrary to what they say, you can to some extent communicate with the worm in two distinct ways. The first way is, I think oftentimes what we want with a relationship partner is someone we can open our heart to, someone we can share everything with, and that process of sharing in of itself, regardless of the response, leads to a level of significant catharsis. And we still think you can do that with the worm. In fact, it's probably even better because there's no possibility of the worm like reprising against you or saying that you're wrong. You should have a constantly supportive worm who can agree with you. But also we think you can communicate to the worm to some extent. Because all you have to do is like have two cards, one that's like a green card and one that's like a red card, and the worm just has to like wriggle onto the green card to indicate <laughs> and wriggle onto the red card to indicate disagreement. And that seems like some level of communication would be wrong. But now, fourth of all, and this is really important, actually dating a worm sounds great because there's no possibility of conflict, no possibility of emotional risk. No possibility of damage. It just sounds pretty good, right? Like you've got this worm who's constantly around, who's with you, who can bring with you to places. That just sounds like it just sounds fun. And you know that they have had this constant loving relationship previously. But I just think this is a probably quite a good relationship overall. Like weighing all of these benefits of emotional certainty, of someone you can open your heart to against sex. Yeah, I mean, just masturbate, man. It's good enough. Really. Would you advocate for the man? Honestly, use this logic in dating about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is recorded is really bad, isn't it? <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, so the end point of all of this then is just that, like, a worm relationship is a great relationship. The alternative relationships are likely to be shitty, incredibly uncertain, incredibly emotionally vulnerable, and so on. Just date the worm, it probably could be quite nice. Now, second thing I want to talk about is morality. Ruben says, you have no obligations to others, you only have an obligation to yourself, and then it talks about epistemic access, literally incomprehensible. But essentially what I think is that you do have an obligation to this worm. The reason is very simple, you have made a promise, namely to stay together with them for life. And I think that that promise largely got the same. In the same way that we think that someone who, for example, has dementia and who's your potential partner, you still have an obligation towards them. You still have that obligation on outside house and you've generated that because you've had a level of commitment to it. And also the worms who are largely relied on you. I don't think you can just make the speculative claim that some system exists to look after the worm. Now, given this then, you have a strong moral obligation to look after this worm and continue to date it because that's a promise that you made previously that you committed to deeply and that you deeply value in the form of a relationship. Now, why is being a moral person very valuable to you? I think that like in your interest, it's probably a part of interest to be moral. The reason is very simple. We like look up to and idolize morally valuable agents, and that provides the main sort of justification we have in our lives to engage in particular actions. And we also like don't at all envy like evil people who engage in immoral actions. So insofar as we think this is an important part of your moral set of obligations, we think this is something that you probably really care about. Again, an analogous to the dementia case, the level of commitment we see there. And insofar as that's the case, we think you probably should stay with them, like morally speaking, but also you care about morality, and so that's the commitment too. At the end of the day then, even if you don't buy that dating a worm is great, although I think it probably is, you have a moral obligation to do this, and that's very significant. Very proud <laughs> First, responding to this point about like dating as a middle-aged person being shit. Secondly, a point I'm titling worm side piece, or what I like to call the universe of potential relationships that can, you can exist in with your worm is actually quite large, right? Because they need to defend a committed monogamous relationship as opposed to potential other types of beautiful polyamorous relationships that could exist between you and your worm lover. Uh, secondly, Two subpoints on if you love the worm, set it free. 
First, with respect to consent, and second, with respect to the well-being of the worm, completing the argument that was only teasered by Ruman um, for a few reasons. So first, direct engagement in terms of the baiting as a middle era, sorry, the dating. Presumably <laughs> <laughs> also the baiting as a middle dating person is pretty shit. Um, okay. Look, um, I don't want to say this to a room of debaters, but like dating is not that bad, right? Like, like it's fine. Um, so, so they, they said like, ah, oh, it's really horrible. Like you have to go on new dates and meet new people and have experiences. And this seems horrible. Um, dating can be, for example, exciting as you're like meeting new people. There's like lots of unknowns which are happening. You can learn like the preferences of someone and the history and how that reacts and how that relates to like what makes up their personality. You can maybe have the chance to find a new kindred spirit and probably you have a particularly traumatic experience that might find you, for example, that you can relate to the, like, the difficulties of having an ex-worm husband or ex-worm wife. Um, uh, like also like 30 exchanges on the app. It can just be fun to have grids. It can be fun to have a game, right? And then you can like crucially, you can self-select your strategies. So if the apps are really that terrible for you, then like go to bars. I'm, I'm sorry, there's like a lot of middle-aged people that are looking for love. A lot of people end up divorcing. A lot of people sadly have uh, loss of life, uh, these types of things. Another crucial point here, motivation scales with how lonely you are, right? So if it's something that makes you really, really horribly sad, then you are more likely on the comparative to continue to do lots of things in order to meet people. So it's a self-correcting problem, not that big of a deal. Finally, one point of framing. You're not a debater, like you're otherwise like a normal human, right? You like traveling, hanging out with friends, eating food, and finding the gym to your plan, right? Like it's, you don't have a really uh, a select list of people that you can do. It's likely that you're going to be able to find a partner. I don't think it's true. Secondly, they say dating a worm is nice because you don't have conflict, emotional risk, or damage. Yeah, but you don't have any of the positive benefits either, and being alone also means you don't have conflict, risk, or risk of damage. And I think that's a less exciting life. Um, three, finally, this whole promise thing, right? First of all, I'm not sure we get like substantial reasons to suspect that this person would value their promise over all other things. Like, yes, I acknowledge that this person has stayed with their partner for 15 years, but we exist in a society that realizes, for example, that people can move on, that people can change, that people can be turned into worms. And as a result of this, probably there's some level of understanding for like these types of commitments. And probably you, you enter into that commitment knowing that that's possible. Um, I mean, like, you need to know the conditions of the contract before entering into it, and I think that knowing that divorce is a possibility and that knowing that this is something that could eventually um, change is like one of the conditions that you entered into. So I think it's fine. Um, I don't think this promise is that ma massively important. Okay, so um, first a little bit of framing. Presumably the worm like also wants to stay in the relationship with you. I just think that's important to note, but it'll become relevant later when I talk about consent. So first let's go into like worm side things, right? Um, so note that the burden of Gov is to say that you're in a committed monogamous relationship with the worm, which means that polyamory is within the debate and allows us then, if we can prove to you that like sides would reasonably agree to this, you can access a lot of the benefits and avoid a lot of the harms that opposition says will get, like guilt for leaving, that type of thing. Why is it likely that these groups of people will agree to something like a polyamorous relationship despite being a, in a committed relationship for 15 years, right? Because that's the obvious challenge. So first, yes, loyalty is important to you over 15 years, but also a characteristic that you clearly have is recognizing that people change and being willing to make certain concessions for your partner's changes. No relationship exists in a static flux. You constantly have to adjust your expectations and, and the expectations of your partner, right? So no relationship survives without compromises. So you have a base level willingness to make change. The evidence for this is like, look at a, a, a marriage that's like most long distance, people opening it up to these types of things. And given that this is a way more substantial change than just like being in a different thing and not being able to communicate, that's pretty bad. You, and you also love your partner a ton, a new mechanism. So you realize this empathy, you have communication. Your partner realizes that sex is impossible. The worm will probably be willing to see you. Also note that that worm is then seeing you suffer, being you so, seeing you so lonely, all that type of thing, likely to be that that worm makes the agreement. Finally, note that there's a plurality of alternatives. That means you can explore all of the potential relationship constellations to find something that works for you and for your own preferences. Okay, if you love the worm, set it free. Consent, uh, consent, right? First, addressing this point of like whether or not words can meaningfully consent in like the two card thing, right? Um, 
One, I don't think worms have eyes or ears, right? I'm just not sure that outside of this they would be able to communicate with you. I'm also not sure about the definition of sentience, right? Like maybe it means it has an awareness, but it's unclear that it can process human language to the extent that you say it can or understand norms of consent, right? And note that worms are entirely controlled by you for a period of a year, right? That is a massive power asymmetry. You control what they see. You control their worm friends. You control the dirt that they eat. You control the worm sex that they potentially have. Yes. He explained why you're not an average person and why any intuition on how you cope or move yeah. doesn't apply. You don't need so, 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 sorry, I just think like a lot of people are in long term relationships, right? And I think that's like reasonably average. I think that's the norm of our society. I think society is set up with like tax codes about long term relationships. This is clearly the norm. Okay. Um, so, Note that um, that's different. Okay, so yeah, that, you control the entirety of the worm's life, so it's consent over like a massive thing. And to the extent that we value norms of consent in like other areas, and we crucially value norms of like active consent all the time in other areas, this is probably an even more important area, right? And that's different than like someone in a coma because the worm is sentient and it has the experience of it. But independent of consent, the worm would be happier without you. So Ruben said that yes, the worm could like find other worm friends, but if the worm wanted to be in the relationship, then you need to explain why the worm is making a bad decision for its own long-term health, because presumably the worm would be able to prioritize that. So why is the worm making a bad relationship? A, um, it just had a super traumatic experience happen to it, and it's probably not thinking clearly because it is now a worm. Um, B, it's probably blinded by this delusion and feeling of duty, even though it's not the best. And then B, they don't know all of the earthly pleasures that they could otherwise experience because they're new to a worm. They don't know what it's like. So secondly, he needs to prove that the worm is likely to find such a relationship. Society exists, probably worm tinder or grinder exists, or bumble from the feminist worm. Institutions <laughs> will likely help that because there's gonna be sanctuary of the worm clubs for these reasons. Please vote. <laughs> Fundamental problem with the opposition bench in this debate is one of shallowness. They love people for sex. They love people for their human form. They love people because they provide a second income and they sometimes wash the dishes. In both in government, we recognize that love is something that is a bit more profound than that. You love someone because of who they are. Insofar as this worm is still the same person, hers in first life, can't deny that one, you still love them and you can't leave them. But moreover, you still love them for all the same reason. They still provide you everything that you ever wanted to begin with. And so that's why our first extension gets ahead. Because we show why staying committed to your beautiful worm wife is the greatest pleasure that you can get in life. And it's worth noting the comparative is dating in middle age, which is nasty as hell. In response to that stuff, which is like, oh, it's easy. Like, maybe it's easy if you're a young buck like Mr. Layman over there. <laughs> we would know. All the good ones are taken. Because if they're so good, why aren't they currently in relationships? Second of all, because you've been in a relationship so long, you've probably let yourself go a bit, and you're probably chilling off that desirable, even to the really hot ones that are out there, assuming you're a superficial attack. But we would know that the worm has everything you want. Why is it that someone loves someone else? It's not because of their height or their eyes or their waistline, or because of their, like, girl or empty chance or teeth. You love them, they are who they are. And contra opening opposition, who spend all of their time talking about shared income and sex, we think these are highly superficial things. Because if it turned out that the person you were dating just like started earning a bit less, it'd be pretty brutal.
going to lead them after 15 years of being badly in love with them. If they're somewhat less good at sex, like I'm sure you can put up with that. I'm sure you were happy to put up with that. You were glad to put up with that because it was never the sex that mattered in the first place. And this also, I think, deals to a large degree with opening government, who's deep concern if you're basically too scared of the guilt if you leave them. I think this is kind of a terrifying reason to date someone, and it's not the reason that you love them. You don't stay with someone because you're like, oh shit, like I feel bad if I left them. You stay with them because that is what is so good about them, and that is why it's good for closing government, because we identify the core reason that people stay in relationships. And this reason is a constant, even though they are now alive. So when we talk about sex and monkey brain, I think that might just be getting a little bit autobiographical. Because we would know, because most people honestly envy the sorts of love that old couples have for one another. And they don't envy them because they imagine at the nursing home they're like ruthlessly jackhammering night off the time. They envy them because of the openness in their relationship, the security they have, the affection they show one another. And Annie can show that these are the things that are constant in your relationship with your beautiful wild wife. And this is even better than a human relationship. Because once you sort of give up on the dumb shit like sex or looking at them in the mirror or whatever, you can focus on the things that matter. But also you don't have these disagreements that arise. You have this secure quietude, this knowledge that you are loved and this knowledge that you are safe with them. And that is what means that your worm is by far the best partner you can have. Even if you could leave them for someone who is at the height of their sexual powers, who can provide you with all the second income in the world and who can like always oh, I'm like put the toilet seat up or something, whatever it is the food was like. A worm would still be better than that. Because when you get home, you can look over at the terrarium longingly. They can crawl around your head. They can have these little conversations with you. So the government's like, oh, you can't communicate with them because they don't have sight. I don't know, use braille or something. Like, they can use the directions of words. You know, when, when you're so madly in love, all sorts of ideas present themselves. And if the whole world is against you for opening government, I don't see opening up vision. I don't think you care because you have everything you could ever need in your beautiful one. But also you would note, simply that leaving the worm is evil, as Annika said. Basically, because you swore to love them and you do love them, your continued relationship with them creates obligations. Closing up vision is like, well, if you think about it, your marriage vows probably have some kind of implicit exit clause. Like, come on, grow up. Like, the one wants to stay with you for their own analysis. And I think that commitment that the one shows to you and the commitment that you have shown to the one creates that obligation to look after them. And we would know that leaving the one is important, or the fact that it is evil is important. First of all, because it violates your own moral code. It's not that you won't be able to live with yourself. It's simply the fact that it's not that you suffer because it violates your moral code. There are things that are more important than your suffering. People are willing to suffer for all sorts of things, and that's what we get ahead of. It's not, not just that, like, you know, it's phenomenologically unpleasant to feel guilty. But second of all, we would note that even if you've never felt guilty, the fact that you did an evil thing is something that's against your own interests. I would like to talk here for a little bit about Genghis Khan. He had all the fun in the world, and he had plenty of sex, he massacred people, and he loved massacring people, and I don't think he had a conscience. Do you envy Genghis Khan? Did Genghis Khan have a good life? I think the answer to that, if you're a rational person, is no, because he lived a bad life, even though he didn't care that he was evil. So even if you leave your beautiful worm life, even if you forsake the great joy, and you somehow magic your way into a great relationship, even though you're probably like bald as hell, like that's still not something that is in your interest because you have fundamentally become an evil person. If you are a narcissistic, soul sociopath that wants to control the world, you do a friend. But you are unlikely to be one because you're the average person that should set the world free. Take care. Ah, uh -huh. I mean, it's like setting the one free thing to get like eaten by a bird or something. Or you look like you're just sending them to the fucking orphanage. They're like, oh, they just keep them in a bucket and give them some mud. They can use them. But you talk to them, they want to stay there. Also, your clothing says that they want to stay with you. So setting, it's like setting, it's like having a child and setting them free by just leaving them to the That's not freedom. And so that's why we get a host ahead of opening off this. Basically, that they present a highly shallow view of love. A love that is so contingent on someone's human form. Something as trivial as that, rather than who they are, what they think, how they look, how they view you. Those are the things that matter, and those are the things that closing government points to. Finally, on closing opposition, they talk about polyamory. 
My first response is I want you to get out your phone and type into the URL bar, redis.com slash r slash polyamory. These people are not having a good time. They are having a good time. And that's the people like the stability that comes around the two-person relationship. People can't handle the dynamic. There is envy. There is horrible things. And I think introducing, you know, more people to your relationship or another person to your relationship is something that will likely, you know, throw it off the rails into the deep end. Finally on consent, they say, well, they've got no eyes nor ears. Again, I noticed that other senses exist. You can, you can communicate with Braille. They can move in particular directions. If you touch them and they keep wriggling away, but like, you'll probably take a hint, right? Like, it's like, how <laughs> understanding with like a gold they have in my turn, I feel like opening opposition because like, you know, they can communicate things to you through that physicality, you know? It's not just words, even though we're all debated. The final thing they say the worm is food and wants out. We think it's like the fact that I'm being transformed into worms, they probably want stability. They probably want love. They probably want you, and that's the key. And that's why it has to be close to me. <laughs> I think what everything boils down to in this debate is fundamentally what it is that you want for your partner. And I think what we're going to ultimately win over this debate and how it is that providing for your partner's consent and providing for their needs is ultimately what allows you to meet that type of satisfaction. In other words, if you love your partner, you will let them go fuck some more maids. Before that, two extraneous pieces of rebuttal. The first, why does it all go benefits can come from a neopet? Secondarily, why it is that the type of support networks that exist in this world for mixed species relationships create more harm than good for you as an individual in a mixed species relationship. First, why it is that gov can be achieved by a neo pet? I really think that if all Mark wants from a relationship is to be able to come home and know that there's someone there, a neo pet can do so so much more consistently for that. And in fact, I think so much more morally, given the consent analysis that we've already got from my partner. But I I think specifically then it also comes in the question of like, okay what am i doing instead of that right and i think it comes down to the question of dating and dating as a middle age person i think the one response we got from cg was that all the good ones are taken and i have two observations here First, you can capitalize on a really paradigmatic moment in people's lives when there are more divorcees than ever within your age group. And so you can look at all the other people who are newly traumatized by the same loss that they're talking about and connect with them about that. They can say, oh, my partner cheated on me. You can say, oh, my partner turned into a worm. I'll say, it's kind of fucked up, bro. You can say, I know. Fun anyways, if you can find a way to connect with people who are going through places at the same life stages, you can it's not because of the same problem. But the second reason why you're going to have a great pool of options to choose from is because, yes, maybe some of the older good ones have gone, but there's plenty of new up-and-coming options. And what that means is that when you enter into middle age dumb, you have ascended to a higher level of dating being because you are now a daddy. You are now a daddy. And what I think that means is a fucking test you fucking pull, right? So I think that you have a lot more options when it comes to who you're considering on those apps. These are no options that you never had prior within your early age years. And so I think this gives you a phenomenal more ability to be, I mean, this is this is like Aladdin, new world shit. Like all of a sudden, 20 year olds are going to be like hanging all over you. You provide age, you provide maturity, you provide wisdom. No, these are all optical. You don't actually have to have any of that shit to be able to pull when you go to bars based on their perception of you. So I think you're more likely to have far more options. But the second response here is that if we as a person 
are open, being charitable, right? They are open and like actively considering whether or not we should stay. That means you are open and actively considering and being open to the idea of dating a literal fucking worm. Which means when you return back to the uh, when you turn back to the ass, your bar has dropped so far down that every single person will be good by comparison. Which means people you would have passed by at the flip or like swipe of an app are all of a sudden like far better in comparison to providing literally all of the things that your worm daddy can no longer provide for you. And so I think the increase in shit here, scale and quantity, either from being a fucking daddy or just from having a much lower bar and see just like trauma also lowers your bar and like desperation and loneliness and I want to connect. All of those synthesize together to mean that you just have way more options you have before and you are A, likelier to find someone, but B, yeah. more importantly, you are likely to think that you will find someone and be fine to go out and date and try and break up with them. But the third thing is like, it's also not permanent, which again, like speaks to the flexibility of how we can engage with this relationship that Braden told you. Like we could be polyamorous. No, we can also break up with the worm, try to go back on the apps and if it fails, come back to them. And that's still a model that exists on our side uniquely that doesn't on theirs. The types of flexibility in which we can engage with this worm relationship is important. I think the second thing in this debate, though, is like, how does it you get support? Moji tells us there's likely to be forum. Oh, oh, doesn't respond and just says, no, they're not. I don't know you want to engage. That's charitable here. I think there probably would be other mixed species relationships, like support forums, Q and A's. Why would you not attend? I think attending a mixed species relationship seminar creates the unique perspective where you are reminded of the fact, or you experience other couples going through the exact same type of un like uh, what's the word entrenched problem at like problem with the relationship that you're having. And so when you're like a queer person, or like literally, literally, literally any other type of person going to one of these support groups, like you can talk with your partner. Your partner might say, like, I'm thinking of the like trying out anal, you know, you know, I don't know how you feel about that. We're talking with other couples, and you can talk with another couple and be like, okay, maybe I ha might happen to be a person that doesn't have a penis, and they might suggest, oh, have you ever tried pegging? And there's meaningful ways to find solutions to the physiological or emotional problems you have. But in these mixed species support groups, it's trauma. It is dread. Literally, everyone is facing problems that are like physiologically impossible to solve, and it makes you feel like shit about yourself and your relationship, so you opt out. And so I think you are more alone than ever when you're in that mixed species relationship. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing here, though, is to win on the government because OG and I want to be really charitable here because I don't think OO was in this regard. He has some really phenomenal analysis that was beautiful, honestly, about loyalty and how that constitutes you as a person. They literally were like, this person is like dead ass at Gryffindor. Cool. So Gryffindor metric prioritizes loyalty. How do we win under that? Three ways that we went under that. The first is with the side piece analysis because I think the ways in which you can either have the worm be a side piece, have the worm be a pet, have the worm be part of your polyamorous relationship, all speak to ways in you, which you can preserve your sense of identity and loyalty within a relationship within that worm that uniquely falls asymmetrically on our side and not theirs. And so I think all the ways in which you might want to swap the guilt that they're so concerned about are matched by the plurality of solutions that we have on our side to be able to stay in a relationship, whatever that looks like, with the worm. And so I think we're able to match their criteria of this person valuing loyalty above all else in a unique way. Before I move on to you. Okay, so I give you four reasons for why you still see the worm as a person. You see people we hinge on, and this perception substitutes the human content you create. And also yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is what I'm addressing. Like, you still see them as a person by your metric. They can be a person in a polyamorous relationship, or they can be like a person that I'm keeping more as a pet. Regardless, whatever way it matches this for me, there's something that we get on our side. I think the second thing here, though, has to do with consent, right? And like a little bit like being a little bit serious here for a moment. But it's like you fundamentally can't get consent for anything in the relationship. Martha mentioned once offhand that you might not always be able to get consent for sex, which is true, but I think what a more inspired version of that case is that you can't get sex fucking anything in this relationship. 364 days a year exist entirely outside the boundaries of consent, entirely outside the boundaries of something that we ascribe absolute precedence to because all utility is coming from your ability to actively engage and have agency within the actions and benefits or harm that you're talking about. And so that is 364, like nearly 100% nearly certainty that you are constantly going to either be acting outside of what the worm wants, hope, needs, or no, you're just also be anxious that you're engaging in that because people absolutely prioritize consent in their consideration for like their moral system, you're probably going to perceive that more than anything else. I think the third and final thing, though, about why it is that you'll likely get over it, which is something that Oh didn't say, which is like Britain's desperation analysis. Like, oh, so they say you'll probably find someone else. Britain fills that analytical gap by being like, you'll probably be like a desperate O who's willing to like find someone else pretty actively. And that's where we get sovereignty. Proud to oppose. <laughs> I'm going to say that 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 I'